With less than 100 days out from the November midterms, primaries were held yesterday in four states plus a special election in Ohio. We take a look at how those contests are playing out and what they signal for both parties in the fall. Last night, Ohio Republican Troy Balderson carried on as if he was a winner. He said he'd work hard for his Columbus area House District, even sent a gesture of thanks to the head of his party. I'd like to thank President Trump. But while Balderson leads in the current vote tally, that lead is razor thin over Democrat Danny O'Connor in this traditionally Republican district. 50.2% for Balderson, 49.3% for O'Connor. Still too close to call. Last night, O'Connor matched the energy of his supporters, and there was no talk of conceding defeat in this special election. We're not stopping now. Tomorrow we rest, and then we keep fighting through to November. His performance encouraged state Democrats. At the end of the day, to have it be close ultimately is a big sign of momentum going into November. And this great man, President Trump, Meanwhile, the White House said today that President Trump, who campaigned for Balderson, will continue supporting candidates who back his agenda. The president had backed several other candidates competing on Tuesday in Republican primaries. Michigan gubernatorial candidate Bill Schuette, Michigan Senate candidate John James, and Missouri Senate candidate Josh Hawley all won the GOP nominations in their races. And in neighboring Kansas, the Trump-backed Republican gubernatorial candidate, Chris Kobach, has the smallest of leads, less than 200 votes over the state's incumbent Republican governor, Jeff Collier. The Associated Press is not projecting a winner in that race either. Collier has been in state government for a decade, but only been governor for half a year, while Kobach, Kansas's current secretary of state, has gained a national profile with hardline conservative stances on immigration and voting rights. In Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer clinched the Democratic nomination for governor over Abdul El Sayed in a contest that tested the staying power of liberal candidates like El Sayed, who were backed by independent Senator Bernie Sanders. Michigan will also almost certainly send the first ever Muslim woman to Congress. Rashida Tlaib won the Democratic primary to fill, starting in January, the Detroit area seat vacated by Congressman John Conyers after he was accused of sexual misconduct. Talib will have no Republican opposition in the fall. Smooth sailing for one of the record 185 women who are major party nominees for House seats this midterm year. And here for more on those election results is Kyle Kondik. He analyzes elections at the University of Virginia's Center for Politics, and he's also the author of The Bellwether, Why Ohio Picks the President. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Last night, lots of primaries, lots of different states. What stood out to you overall? I think the big picture takeaway is that a lot of election results since President Trump got elected have sort of suggested a Democratic bounce back and the potential for the Democrats to have a good election in November. Uh, Nothing that happened last night would make you think differently about that. I mean, I know that Democrats did not win the Ohio 12 special election, but they came pretty close in a district that uh, really should be very difficult for a Democrat. And so the environment, I think, remains good uh, for Democrats. Democrats, particularly as you look at the battle for the for the U.S. House of Representatives. Let's talk a little bit more about that Ohio race in particular. It's still too close to call, as we were reporting. But as you said, this should we should not have been talking about this race at all. This should be a clear red victory. Yeah, this is a, a kind of a bedrock Republican district. Uh, Ohio Governor John Kasich used to hold it, and then Pat Tiberi, uh, the most most recent representative, held it for a long time. Donald Trump won the district by about 11 points, and to me, that 11 point margin actually sort of understates how Republican this district is. Because if you look at results down the ballot in in recent history in this district, it's even you know redder than that. And you know it looks like Troy Balderson, the Republican, is going to win, uh, but by less than a less than a percentage point. And you know, so that means that uh, Danny O'Connor, the Democrat, uh, is going to perform about 10 points better on margin than Hillary Clinton did there in 2016. That's about in keeping with what the average change we've seen in these special elections have been, uh, both at the federal level and also at, at the state level.
So as you were saying, not too much to change our opinion about the national picture. No, I don't think so. I mean, and again, I don't necessarily know if, if you know, it's a slam dunk or something that Democrats are going to win the House. But I, I think you, if you're the Democrats, you, you look at last night and you probably feel pretty good about what you saw. Right. Republicans, of course, could come back and say, hey, we won. Uh, and they've won most of these special elections, but um, they've, they've really all taken place in, in, in places that are more Republican than the national average. Certainly, Ohio 12 is, is to the right of the national average, too. A lot of House seats will be up for grabs in Washington state, and they have a particularly unusual way of doing it. What, what were you looking at there? So Washington, uh, like California, uh, they have a, a top two primary, meaning that all the candidates compete on the same ballot, then the top two finishers advance uh, to November. And uh, sometimes the, uh, the, the two-party vote totals in that state and in California can sort of be pr predictive of the fall. And the Democratic vote totals in some key districts out there really seem quite good. They're still counting votes out there. Uh, but it, it leads one to think that Democrats might be able to pick up a seat or more out of Washington state. Uh, and again, when you only need to pick up 23 nationally, those seats add up pretty, pretty quickly. So I think Democrats were also pretty encouraged by uh, Washington state. But again, vote totals are not totally final yet. Missouri had some uh, union labor issues on the ballot last night, and this obviously comes when the national trends for unions are not great. Membership is down. The Supreme Court had just uh, taken a, a little bit of wind out of their sails as well. What happened there last night? Uh, there was a kind of a right to work uh, referendum on the ballot, and it failed uh, by more than two to one. Uh, which, you know, is, is a great result uh, for labor, even in a state like Missouri, uh, which used to be kind of a national bellwether state and, and really has trended Republican over the last uh, 10, 10 to 15 years. You know, it also speaks to a larger phenomenon in American political life, which is that uh, when you've got a conservative president, the public all of a sudden starts to act a little bit more liberal. Uh, just like when there's a liberal president, the public starts to be a little bit more conservative. Uh, we see that on public opinion, for instance, on the Affordable Care Act. It's become more popular since President Trump got elected. And you can maybe see it a little bit in these right to work results in that that's a, you know, a liberal agenda item fighting right to work. Right. And uh, Democrats succeed in defeating it by a big margin in Missouri last night. Speaking of the president, how do you see his influence having played out last night? Uh, I think the president, you know, he took credit basically for Balderson apparently winning, but at the same time, if Hillary Clinton were in the White House, Ohio 12 probably wouldn't have been that much of a contest. I mean, we know from American history that uh, you know, holding the White House, uh, you pay a toll for that uh, down the ballot in these special elections and midterms often, particularly when the president's approval rating is poor as this president's uh, approval is. Uh, and so again, you know, maybe Trump's visit to Ohio 12 on Saturday moved the needle a little bit, but if he were more popular, the race probably wouldn't have been so close to begin with. And what about on the flip side? There's been a lot of talk recently about the, the, the Bernie Sanders, Ocasio-Cortez slice of the Democratic Party. How does last night look for them? Uh, they did not succeed in, in two of the two of the high profile races, the Michigan governor's race in the Democratic primary and also a House primary in uh, Kansas's third district. Uh, sort of the more establishment oriented candidates, one particularly in that uh, Michigan race. And it just goes to show that as impressive as uh, Ocasio-Cortez's win against Joe Crowley was in New York state, it was more the exception than the rule. I would say that the so-called Democratic establishment is generally getting their candidates through these primaries, although she is a, a, a major exception given that she beat a, a top-ranking House Democrat. Kyle Kondek, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.